camera, the footage that this intro was shot on costs about $45,000. And that's just for the body. That's not without any screen or viewfinder, no batteries. There's no autofocus in this camera. It's terrible in low light. It weighs a ton. You have to buy the viewfinder for it separately. And guess what? That costs over $7,000. And then once you have that, there's no way of mounting it to the camera. You have to buy another mounting bracket or a cage or something to put it on the camera. And the viewfinder is not even that good. You pay $7,000 and it's not really that good at all. And get this, this is one of the cheapest Aries there is. They go all the way up to like way over $100,000 for one camera. Gene, how do you, how do you film with this thing? <laughs> oh my gosh. Actually, this reminds me of the, the commercial days. It's like bringing back memories right now. Like standing like this for like an hour filming a commercial. You just, you, you got to keep filming until the director yells cut and your muscles are starting to shake. Have you ever had that? Yeah. Muscles All are starting time. to shake and you're just like, <laughs> you just got to push it. And like keep it as stable as possible. And as soon as they say cut, you're just like, oh my gosh, thank goodness. Thank goodness. <laughs> but you try to play it off cool. You're just like, yeah. Yeah, no worries. Just gotta put this camera down for a second. <laughs> so, Gene, why, why do you think Hollywood uses this camera? Because so it's so huge <laughs> and it looks impressive. Because you look, look like right a now. beast. Look how, look, look I, I look like I'm really, really talented. I look like I know what I'm doing. I think it's just well, a flex, on. actually, it right? Is. It's just a flex. Yes, both. <laughs> Both visually, but also like I'm, I'm constantly flexing. Yeah, yeah, actual flex. like, it's a workout. <laughs> so why the heck are the Airy cameras the most widely used cameras in Hollywood? Even with all these things it's lacking and how hard it is to use, it's just not very usable when you first buy it. You have to buy so many things to just make this camera usable. Why is Hollywood using these cameras? Okay, so it does have some really great specs also. It shoots ProRes and 4K and up to 200 frames per second and 1080. It does raw video. It's got some pretty good features, but in the end, the one reason why Hollywood uses this camera the most is the image. And for those of you who don't know, up until only about 10 years ago, Hollywood still only really used film cameras for all of the Hollywood films, pretty much, the majority of them. And then about 10 years ago, they started switching into the digital realm of things. And that was because film is so good. The image that you get when you shoot on film is really, really nice. And that took a really long time to replicate or to have a better image in digital than the film image was. It wasn't really until the Aerie Alexas came out that people are like, oh, okay, this is, this is close, similar to film, maybe even a little bit better than the film image. So, uh, some people were still, no, no, film is the way to go. But then others were like, oh, this, this digital image is actually, I, I like it better than the film image. So once the Alexa came out, that's when Hollywood and the very high end, the most high end of filmmaking started to realize the potential in digital filmmaking. So why is the Aerie Alexa's image so good? Why is this the camera of choice? And first off, it's the color science. It has by far, out of all the cameras, I'm su slightly subjective, but I think most people would agree, it has the best color science out of any camera, especially when it comes to skin tones. It has just the most natural and just good looking skin tones. If you thought Canon's like this camera have good skin tones, guess again, the Alexas have way better skin tones than the Canons. There's some sort of magic going on with the image processing. I have no idea what they're doing, but the image just looks so good and detailed, even though it's not overly sharp, which is kind of a characteristic of a cheaper digital camera, having that overly sharp look. It almost looks kind of soft at times, but when you look at it, there's just so much detail in the image. And a lot of the Alexas don't even shoot actual 4K. I think it's 3.2K and then they just up res it to 4K. And that's why a lot of uh, Netflix shows aren't shot on the Aerie Alexas because Netflix has this policy of no, it has to be true 4K. It can't be this up res thing. Um, so yeah, that's kind of interesting. But I think Aerie with all their testing found that this was the best kind of the most optimal image they could get. Instead of doing true 4K and having so many pixels, they decided to go with a little bit less and have a better image. So I guess 
quality over quantity. And then probably the biggest reason why the Arri Alexa has such a nice image is the dynamic range. And I've explained this before, it's basically the difference between the brightest parts of your image and the darkest parts. So for example, my shirt is pretty dark here and then uh, this part is pretty bright. So how much of a difference in light can the camera capture? And the Arri Alexas have the biggest dynamic range out of any camera on the market right now. Yes, you can argue that because there's not really a scientific standard that camera companies are going by. So some companies claim they have 14 stops just like the Arri Alexa claims and it is not the same at all. So there's, there isn't really a scientific way of comparing um, the numbers because every camera company kind of does it a little bit differently. But the Arri Alexa has the most dynamic range and that really gives its film-like look. Film has a ton of dynamic range and this is probably the biggest thing that digital sensors struggled with was getting that same amount of dynamic range and not just the dynamic range, but the way things kind of roll off. So on a digital, a cheaper digital camera, when you have something that overexposes, it's like we have we have detail, we have detail, and then it just goes nuclear like instantly. There, there isn't a nice roll off. Whereas on the Lexa, it would be like, we're good, we're good, we're good, we're good, we're going into overexposed, overexposed, and now we're overexposed. It, it slowly rolls off into that overexposed area. And that looks really nice. It's really pleasing to the eye instead of having that, that quick roll off into that nuclear overexposed zone. It's unlike any camera out there right now. The, the reds are pretty close, I think, but the Arri Alexas are still way more widely used in the highest, highest high-end commercials and movies. The Arri Alexas are still the most popular for most DPs. So why would Hollywood use a crazy, crazy expensive camera that doesn't even have all the features of a cheaper DSLR camera? Well, because they want the absolute best image. They have essentially an unlimited budget. They have as much money as they wanna use on films. So they want the absolute best image. What's the best image they can get? That's what they're gonna pay for. They don't care about convenience or how easy it is to use or the specs necessarily. They just want the best image. And the further you go in your career, the less you're gonna start caring about specs and the more you're gonna care about the actual image what does your footage look like at the end of the day? Image becomes the highest priority by far. The further you go in your career, the higher budget the, the commercial or TV show or movie is, the image is the main thing, not how easy it is to use. Or price for that matter. And that's why Hollywood consistently right now is using the Arri Alexa the most for their highest and biggest productions of of course, they're gonna choose the camera with the absolute best image in their opinion. No, but actually, what do you, what do you think? What, what's like, what's the, what are some of the reasons? Um, you know, like, I think like, you know, even just like the camera you're shooting on right now, the a7 III, like they're, they're great cameras, they have a lot of power, uh, but they're definitely designed, like the designers have like the consumer in mind. As someone that just wants to pick up a camera, have like very convenient features, this is like, this is very much designed with an entire crew in mind. Zero so, convenience. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no convenience, like no smart features, nothing that makes it easy to shoot on. As a matter of fact, just me shooting right here with this like by myself is like reminding me how much this camera is not designed for <laughs> solo operation. Like I'm dying. It's like, <laughs> Maddie's like, get that shot over there. I'm yeah, like- Yeah, just keep going, G. Uh, yeah, just a little bit yeah, more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, so, you know, like, uh, one, uh, ah, oh, I'm going away. The wind's going to take away. you, man. <laughs> I, I hope the sound is amazing right now. <laughs> okay, one example is, like, size and weight. You know, you want, like, a small compact camera if you're making a vlog camera for an everyday user. You actually kind of want this weight because right now I'm not running through any sort of stabilization, nothing in the lens, nothing in the camera. But the weight of this itself is just like, it makes it stable. Yeah. And we are handheld right now, so we are still kind of getting a little bit of shake, but it's not like jittery shake. It's like, yeah. it's more like cinematic movement. Yeah, yeah, people don't realize that the heavier the camera is, the smoother, especially the handheld look is. It's like, it, when you have a small camera, you're, you're like, your hands are shaking so much. Well, when you have a big, heavy camera, 
you, just because of the weight, you end up keeping it a lot more stable and it looks a lot nicer, especially for the handheld look. It's not so convenient when you're trying to put it on a gimbal or something like that. 100% and like uh, another example, like IBIS is something that's great to have in a small camera to kind of counter that. And IBIS is great to have like 90% of the time it makes a shot look smoother, but 10% of the time sometimes it might do something kind of weird. This is a different approach. They just want it to work 100% yeah. of the time exactly how they want it to. And you know, if they get like, if you get a super expensive shot and then you see all this like wobble from IBIS, then they're gonna be like, that's unusable. So any like, uh, you don't want any smart feet just trying to just assume that you want to do this like there's a lot of smart no features. auto essentially exactly nothing auto nothing convenient yeah. you gotta do it all yourself exactly the right way mm -hmm. I think the image is something that's really hard to explain also it just looks really really good right like yeah this camera is great but this camera image is so much nicer but if you put them side by side it's kind of hard to say exactly why it looks better it's kind of like it's so subjective, but at the same time, not subjective. I'd say pretty much everybody would say that that's a better image, but you can't say exactly why. Yeah, I mean, image quality is one of those things that's really hard to define because, you know, in the consumer world, everyone's always just like, we want more resolution, we want better sharpness. We want 8K. Exactly. <laughs> The thing is like, the thing is like what gives it a cinematic look is it's not like, it's, it's really hard to describe because like pixels and stuff, the number of pixels is, you can count that. It's like something you can explain and it's easy to comprehend. Yeah. The cinematic look is very hard to explain. Yeah, I mean like if you watch a Hollywood movie on your iPhone in standard definition, you look at it and you go, that looks really good. I'm watching it in 360p, but it looks <laughs> fantastic. So it's one of those things, it's kind of hard to explain what gives like airy and red cameras that cinematic look. But as soon as you look through this viewfinder, you immediately see it. You're like, wow, this like everything looks nice and creamy, like skin tones look so good. I don't know if it's dynamic range, if it's color science or whatever, but there's, there's some magic voodoo in here. Something's going on. So the, the short answer is it's magic. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's just magic in a box. Now, am I gonna start using an Alexa for all my YouTube videos? No, it, it doesn't make sense for me. It doesn't work well, well at least not yet. Uh, it just doesn't work for my filmmaking, the things that I'm making. It makes sense for Hollywood, but it's not gonna make sense for a lot of you guys until you're in that range of you got massive budgets and the most important thing, the absolute most important thing is the image, not how long it takes to use that camera, how easy it is to use that camera, how much it costs to use that camera. When only the image matters in the end, that's when you should start looking at cameras like the Alexas, because they're pretty dang heavy and hard to use and very, very, very expensive. Like one camera is pretty much worth more than all of the gear that I own, uh, all the cameras, all my lenses, everything. It just doesn't fit my needs right now, but it does fit Hollywood's needs. What a beast of a camera though. Just an insane camera. Okay, I'm gonna go back to using my mirrorless cameras. See you guys. Thanks, Gene, for uh, showing me uh, this beast of a Hollywood cinema camera. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and thanks for carrying it around, too. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, okay, let's, can we trade? Let's trade. <laughs> now, nah, I'll keep this camera. I can, I can carry your ESR. It's fine. <laughs> I got two cameras. You carry the one. It's fair. <laughs>